somebody needs to help me, but this thing has, uh, has dislocated like the Fourth Republic. <laughs> 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 Can I help? Yeah, sure. Okay. okay. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, Malko was talking about his professors and his, his lecturers. So some of the people here, they knew me when I was a baby. So if he's a little bit nervous, you can imagine what, what is happening with me. But thank you all for coming. I have been asked to speak to the theme of event, Has the Fourth Republic Delivered? And what I've decided to do is to present a paper titled Towards a Mindset Revolution, Ghana Beyond Neoliberal Capitalism. Was the Fourth Republic a miracle that led nowhere? He's already said the people who are behind it and so on and so forth. I start out by saying that there is a longer paper which we will circulate after, but in the interest of time and efficiency, I will present a curtailed version and hope that people will read the rest for themselves. So, Chairman, African compatriots, because there are, as you will hear in a, in a few minutes' time, there are people dialed in from many African countries, comrades, citizens, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for inviting me to give this speech at this time. However you look at it, our country is at a critical conjuncture. It is therefore fitting that we take some time to reflect. There is lots to say and not enough time to say it all tonight. Therefore, I will make hard choices on what I focus on, choosing to go deep than to go wide. Those who try to boil the ocean usually achieve nothing. Our forebears, in wise sayings, indeed, and through proverbs, encourage civic participation and critical reflection. You find this inscribed all of our histories and cultures. The amalgam of professional bodies organizing this event is simply keeping faith with cherished African practices in organizing this event. The accounts of West Africa say, Techema damenum yidye mekambi. To wit, as long as I have a tongue in my mouth, I shall participate in the debate. I do have a tongue. I intend to participate in the debate. To be a citizen, not a spectator. I want to start by thanking Ebenezer Chum Asante, Victor Yao Rapti Asante, Akosio Abami, Seth Kwe, Eugene Opoku Dankwa, Albert Jangma, Nanaya Ousu Ansa, Chris Wolf Caesar, Kwekumaya Ankrabedu, and Clarence Nate. They know why I thank them, and God does too. So, first, a few declarations. To the rumor mill, let me douse its flames from the onset. I have no political ambitions whatsoever, no interest in becoming an assemblyman, member of parliament, minister district chief executive, vice president, president, or whatever else there is that people chase in politics. Hopefully that settles it. Now that my beloved literature teacher, Trudy, has become her ladyship justice Gertrude Tokonu, chief justice of the Republic of Ghana, I would have liked to be chief justice too. But that is impossible, as I am not a lawyer and will never be. This evening, I speak only for Yao Insako, no organization or association to which I belong, not even my own family, bears responsibility for what I have chosen to discuss or how I discuss it. I alone remain responsible. In the early 90s, Nana Akufuado, now president of the Republic of Ghana, then a charismatic leading light of the opposition, launched Kwesi Pratt Jr.'s newspaper. He and Professor Kwame Karikari, a man most of us know about and who is here tonight, thankfully, were the two major speakers on the day. They both gave outstanding speeches that drew long ovation from the large audience that had gathered at the International Press Center, then housed on the road to Kolebu. These were dangerous times for those that chose to speak out in favor of democracy and against the system in power. So dangerous that Kwesi Pratt Jr., editor of the newspaper being launched, thanked us for attending the event, quote, even though the captain would know we were there, end of quote. He was, of course, referring to Captain Kojo Chikata. Akufuado announced that he was not there to speak as a, quote, 
leading member of the new patriotic party, MPP, end of quote. He added that the citizen Akufuado existed before the leading member and all his other guises. Tonight, I borrow his wisdom, as I will do on several occasions. The citizen Yao Insako existed before any of his other guises. And Yao Insako, as he has said before, is here to be a citizen, not a spectator. Wherever I tell this story, those not familiar with the details of the struggles that led to the birth of the Fourth Republic, I am asked whether I have retold events accurately. I have. Many who were close friends and fought hand in glove to get what was seen then as the promise of the Fourth Republic are now at each other's throats. Equally, many who were sworn enemies have become close friends or became close friends. In the 90s, I would never have imagined that Jerry Rawlings and Anna Akufuado would become such close friends that in his first speech as president-elect, Jerry Rawlings would be thanked publicly by Akufuado. Nor could I ever have imagined in the weeks that followed the historic Kumipreko demonstrations that so many prominent leaders of the Alliance for Change, AFC, would become so cozy with powerful people in governments of both major political parties in Ghana. Yet, the murderers of young Ahunu Honga and four others would never face justice. Did the Fourth Republic collapse into an elite compromise? What happened to the charismatic and magical human rights lawyer called Nana Akufuado once he became president? What happened to the intrepid campaigner for human rights, my good friend, Kwesi Pratt Jr., the man who never missed an opportunity to remind Ghanaians that at least 248 people had disappeared during the era of the second Jerry Rawlings sensation, that is, the period of the military government, the Provisional National Defense Council. Such questions continue to agitate the minds of many, this evening, we will only be contributing to a needed conversation. Has the Fourth Republic delivered? Will it deliver? Can it ever deliver? This evening will also be an evening of orature. In the fashion, our recently departed global icon, the Pan-Africanist scholar and writer, Professor Michere Gitai Mugo, never ceased reminding Africans is authentically ours. When we sing, when we chant, when we fall silent, let us remember that the blood of Ahunu Honga and four others is upon the head of us all. In honor of Professor Mishere Gitai Mugo. On Friday, June 30th, 2023, at 11.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time at Crowell's Hospital in Syracuse, New York, Professor Mishere Gitai Mugo crossed the river to be with the ancestors. In announcing her death, her immediate family accurately and touchingly said about Mishere that, quote, in her tireless pursuit of Utu, her unwavering commitment to Africana liberation and human rights, and her relentless fight against colonialism, oppression, neocolonialism, and injustice, Mishere remained principled in demonstrating the essence of true humanity. Continuing an attaching act of Pan-Africanist solidarity and kindred scholarship even in grief, Michelle Mugo's family added, and I quote, in honor of the great relationship between Michelle and Ama Ataedu, the Gitai family has decided to hold off Michelle's send-off until her sister has been laid to rest. Michelle Mugo's family and close friends, through a combination of circumstances, involved me in deeper and more touching ways than I could ever have imagined. I choose not to talk about all the details. But I would like to thank my Pan-Africanist friends and comrades, Jabet Amdani, Al Amin Kimathi, Brian Taguka Kagoro, and all the others who were so welcoming of me when I was introduced. Together, as Africans, we are powerful. It is they, more than any other, who convinced me that tonight should be a night that was important in the annals of those who seek a better tomorrow for all Africans. When I put out the president of Ghana's invitation to Professor Amatedu's funeral to the group I earlier referred to, Paolo Nantuya 
wrote these immortal words on tablets of stone for all who love Africa. I quote them completely. Thank you for sharing. Indeed, we join the people of Ghana in mourning the loss of a militant revolutionary intellectual giant and combatant and one of the greatest literary fighters the continent has ever produced. Our sister and comrade, Mumbi Wamugo, is on her way to Accra to represent Mishere and all of us at the funeral of this great daughter of Ghana and all of Africa. The decision to hold off the final send-off of our dear Mishere until her sister, Ama Atedu, has been laid to rest was deliberate and conscious. It was to honor the great friendship between them. The two revolutionary sisters co-parented their children from Harare onwards. Hence, Mumbi and Ama's daughter, Kina, are effectively bereaved twice and bearing twice in a space of exactly one month. We join them. We raise our fists in honor of Ama Atedu and ask the ancestors for intercession to grant comrade and sister Mumbi Wamugo journey mercies on her flight to Ghana to join the people of Ghana in mourning and to grant her journey mercies back to Syracuse to continue arranging the final journey to escort Mishere to rest after a lifetime of struggle. End of quote. Ama Atedu has now been laid to rest and sleeps with the ancestors across the river. Her sister and comrade, Mishere Mugo, will soon join her, as the funeral is only three days away now on the 28th of July. They were both Pan-Africanists. What I say today will use Ghana as a case study, but many who listen will know I am describing the weary, draining, ruinous, and tiring consequences of neoliberalism or neocolonialism, or whatever you choose to call it. I had referred to Michere briefly when I originally wrote this speech. I'm involved in a Pan-Africanist book project on leadership. The book is scheduled to be published in 2024. I had excitedly said to the team behind it that it would be my greatest delight to have Michere give us a blurb. Days after, the great woman was gone. Michere Mugo's family and friends have mobilized Pan-Africanists from all over global Africa to join us in this event tonight. We thank them. This is a great tribute to the power of global African togetherness, a fitting testament and example to the solidity of the two icons, Mishere Gitai Mugo and Ama Atedu. Auntie Ama has been laid to rest. In three days, Mama Mishere joins her. I say in Swahili, Shuja Mishere Gitai Mugo Asanti Sana. Mwalimu Mishere Gitai Mugo Safari Injema. Mama Mishere Gitai Mugo Kwaheri Kabisa. Mr. Chairman, I pray for strength for the audience and indeed for us all. God help us. Dedications. Mr. Chairman, I would like to dedicate this speech to 20 living people and 20 others who have now become ancestors. They are all Ghanaians given the focus of the day. All the ancestors that will be mentioned have left us to rest beyond the river during the existence of the Fourth Republic of Ghana. Beyond that, there is nothing democratic about this list. I do not at all pretend that it is democratic. For the Fourth Republic has taught me that indecisiveness, lack of resolution, absence of leadership, plain indiscipline, and indeed outright chaos and illegality are all sometimes called neoliberal democracy or just democracy. For lack of time, I will not give details for the reasons for my selection. I will simply say in one way or the other, all these people contributed to the emergence and sustenance of the Fourth Republic. The names of the ancestors are Professor Albert Kojo Edubuahi, a.k.a. Kontopiat, Right Honorable Peter Alajete, Charles Bartels Kwesi Zwenes, better known as CVK, Professor Paul Archibald Viani Ansa, a.k.a. Pava, Bernard Jao Darocha, a.k.a. BJ, Professor Ama Atedu, a.k.a. Triple A. Tommy Thompson. Professor Leticia Obing. Asunaba Kweku Dako, Super Odi. Justice Kweku Etru Amwasechi. Professor Ebenezer Lane. Professor Francis Adokufuo. Professor Alexander Edum Kwapong. Professor Kwame Jechi. Professor Joseph Hansen Kwabna Nketia, whose daughter and son-in-law are here with us. Johnny Kwashi Aidan, a.k.a. Uncle Johnny. It was never uncle, it was always Uncle Johnny. Reverend Professor Kwesi Abutia Dixon, 
Michael Asafubwache, the engineer I mean, Alexander Miblebo Andrew Sr., and Coach Sam Ade. While we remember these worthy ancestors in reverence, shall we also pause to reflect on what we will say to them when we meet again where we are all headed? In the land beyond the river where our ancestors dwell. That we allowed what they bequeathed to us to be ransacked by Galamseas and watched helplessly as our water bodies were destroyed. Sometimes when I regard what we are doing in Ghana, I tremble with rage and sorrow. Our ancestors, we offer you libation and pray that your wrath will not be upon our heads. Now we get to honor those still with us. Among the living, we honor Professor Kofi Asari Opoku, Christian Kwabna Apiaje, Professor Florence Abna Dolphine, Professor John Hyde, Professor Ayikwe Ama, Professor Felix Konote Ahulu, Cameron Dodu, Professor Ablade Glover, Professor Kofi Kumado, Justice Professor Mrs. Henrita Minsa Bonsu, Mrs. Marian Pratt, Mrs. Stella Ansa, Dr. Charles Ives Rekubrobe, a.k.a. Tazan, Professor Kwame Karikari, Dr. Rose Kuting Mensa, Professor Al Anachi, Jedouble Ambule, Professor Equia Kwenye here, and Justice Professor Samuel Kofi Datiba. To you all, I say, when you offer drinks to the ancestors, may you find favor. Finally, I dedicate this to all the ordinary people of the African continent. Our revered African ancestor, Professor Chinua Achebe, once wrote, and I quote, God loves ordinary people. If it were not so, he would not have made so many of them. End of quote. A few stories from Nima. I once ate Kenke with Kwekuba Aku Jr., Charles Baini, Kwesi Pratt Jr., Akoto Ampal, Stanley A.G. Blanksin, Kakraba Cromwell, and our then magical and charismatic spokesperson, the man we fondly called dissident lawyer, Nana Akufuado. We were indeed gathered in his Nima residence. This was during the days of the Magnetic Alliance for Change. Nima was also the base of Cabral Blay Amihir, Freddie Blay, and Alaji Fao. I do not know how many times I have asked myself, where is that Nana Akufuado? The one who, knowing that they could be killed during Kumipreko, still turned up with the other leaders to lead the people. I had been at Kwesi Pratt's residence at Kotobabi Down up till midnight the day Kumipreko was going to take place. Kwesi was deeply worried, for they had received incontrovertible evidence that there would be an attempt to disrupt the march and blame the organizers. It was obvious that there could be guns involved. He told me about it all in detail. When those men turned up to lead the march, they knew it could be the last thing they did in this life. But they turned up and led from the front. So where are all these people today when Galamse is killing us? Retired or just tired? I know what we expected from the Fourth Republic then. In a few moments, we shall assess whether it has delivered. Before that, though, Mr. Chairman, I must tell a story that enables me to deliver on my promise to make this a night of oracle. In Nima were two places that I often remember, Dunia Cinema and Hotel Kumbaya. At Dunia Cinema, the then famous operators would be busy behind their projectors. In those days, many of the films shown had killers and blowmen. One of the favorite blowmen was the American actor Chuck Norris the nemesis of bad guys. Often, after the bad guys had caused so much pain, Chuck Norris would appear. And an excited crowd at Dunia Cinema would burst out in celebration, literally screaming in a frenzy. This crowd sometimes included Danjuma Wangyu and the now-celebrated psychologist Norte Dua of Ghana. The Dunia Cinema crowd had their own way of celebrating Chuck Norris. They would say, screaming their lungs out, Chuku Norris, action kwa. Chuku Norris, action kwa. Chuku Norris, action kwa. This evening, whenever I say Chuku Norris, I will expect you to scream like your life depends on it. Action kwa. We are going to give this speech together. Let's go. 
two cool noise. You've got it. So it's not the Ghanaian citizen that is the problem. With good leadership, they follow. <laughs> Common ground on some definitions. Mr. Chairman, before we go further, I would like us to have clarity on what I mean when I say neoliberal capitalism, mindset revolution, miracles that led nowhere, incompetent states, and Robinson Crusoe societies. Let's start with neoliberal capitalism. Neoliberal capitalism sh champions shareholder primacy. It is focused on how to make the highest short-term return for shareholders. It takes no responsibility for the externalities of its end-to-end -end value chain. It will destroy anything in its path to make a profit. It has no sense that there are multiple stakeholders and so focuses only on one stakeholder, the shareholder. In its misguided reasoning, employees, communities, suppliers, customers, governments, competitors, indeed everything must be subordinate to the shareholder. Through the history of humanity, neoliberal capitalism has never worked anywhere. It will never work, and it can never work. Yet in Ghana and much of Africa these days, there's policy addiction to this. Jaded and hackneyed canons of its chief high priest, Milton Friedman, and others are everywhere present. Let's examine a few of them. The business of government is government, not business. And what on earth do we think government is? Government, as far back as philosophy goes, in any culture, has been about the business of seeking the welfare of the people. Which country, with GDP per capita at less than $3,000 per annum, ever managed to precipitate development without government leading the way? I challenge you to give me one example, knowing you cannot, because it does not exist. The private sector is the engine of growth, another fallacy. Why, anyway, are neoliberals so obsessed with GDP growth? And if the private sector is the engine, what is the vehicle that it powers? On which roads does that vehicle travel? Or rail tracks, or airport, or rocket launcher? What is the nature of this vehicle? Professor Amatya Kumar Sen, the polymath and a Nobel Economics Prize winner, once remarked with characteristic integrity, the gross domestic product is a very poor indicator of the quality of life. It does not take note of many things that make life livable. For example, the availability of health care or the quality of the environment. End of quote. The best example I can think of that illustrates the consequences and practice of neoliberal capitalism is what Ghanaians call galamse, the destructive but pervasive form of illegal mining that we are simply unable to control. Mindset revolution. This is the title of three books by Akosu Abami, who we are fortunate to have joining us as a panelist today, with the most recent of the books being Mindset Revolution 3. I understand Mindset Revolution to be the transformation process that is needed at individual level, but must then gain scale to become culture. The result of Mindset Revolution is true intellectual, spiritual, and physical freedom and independence. This must imply necessarily the, many, the absence of many kinds of fear. Mindset revolution liberates from the following fears. Fear of want, fear of insecurity, fear of inferiority, fear of failure, fear of non-beneficial culture, fear of political power, and indeed the fear of fear itself. The sum total of the re-education and total reorientation in thinking required by citizens in a society that hopes to make progress is mindset revolution. Ghana needs a mindset revolution on all fronts. Politics, education, religion, culture, and more. We must jettison the injury colonialism did to our mindsets that makes so many of us feel inferior. How on God's mighty earth does a predominantly black country use expressions like mebroni as a term of endearment. Miracles that led nowhere. This is an expression I use a lot that I learned from the immortal Professor Samir Amin. Hear him. Development is not the result of miracles. It is the result of hard work and creativity. Examples abound of how we, the ordinary citizens, are treated by politicians as a reckless young man does when his interest in a woman before him is animalistic, intense, and truly short-term. He just says anything, whatever it will take. 
Sadly, this is what it has become at election time in Ghana. The major political parties, MPP and NDC, just say something, as we say in Ghana. When we the people face doom so, that is power rationing, and we ask for an update on progress, we are told that the man has become a dead goat. One machake me. One village, one dam. Planting for food and jobs. One district, one factory. Remember them? Then while we implement all these, food inflation gets to 59.7% in 2022. How is this possible? The answer must be obvious. Ordinary people can be misled by such slogans, so the politicians keep minting them. They are meaningless. Veritable examples of miracles and promises that led nowhere. Incompetent states and Robinson Crusoe societies. The two concepts work hand in glove. An incompetent state is a state that cannot enforce its own laws. And a Robinson Crusoe society is a direct consequence of an incompetent society, of an incompetent state. Again, this assertion is exemplified when you look at Galamse, or the fact that we seem unable to keep our cities clean. We have many laws to do these things. When it gets to enforcement, though, something cracks. Once law enforcement lapses, anomie conditions set in, and people live in and tolerate subpar conduct in society, in discipline on the roads, haphazard construction of infrastructure, dumping rubbish anywhere, massive noise pollution, and much more become characteristic presences of our beleaguered society. I'll do a little bit of analysis on selected data trends in the Fourth Republic. All data used here has been obtained from government agencies and from international studies of the relevant sectors that had a section on Ghana. It is one of those sad features of our national character that many agree I should not mention the names of the three public officers who helped me most in this endeavor. I am told I may endanger them. I never thought I was a dangerous person, but that's what I'm told. Four, politicians supposedly do not like those who provide information that does not flatter them. To those who accuse me of not having goodwill for Akufado, I always respond, go and check with the man himself whether he agrees with you. Those who take the risk to tell the man the hard truths about what is going on must wish him well. It is easier to join the band of sycophants and praise singers. To both the NDC leaders and the MPP leaders, I remind them of this fact. Treasure your friends who can criticize you in frank terms and deliver blunt feedback. Often, they are a person's most useful friends. With that, let us dis now discuss some trends based on hard data. These are the facts, and the facts are stubborn. What were the objectives of the Fourth Republic? It seems very fair to me to define the collective aspirations and objectives of the people of Ghana for the Fourth Republic as that which is captured in the directive principles of state policy of the 1992 Constitution. Those who will read the, the actual text will see that I quoted it in extenso. Sections 34 to, to 38 are particularly relevant. We were promised at the inception of the Fourth Republic all citizens, that is, food, clothes, and shelter, plus education, sanitation, and dignity. In summary, we were told that with the Fourth Republic, all citizens of Ghana would get more liberty, more egalitarian opportunity, and more fraternity. The good old liberté, égalité, fraternité, just like the slogan of the French revolutionaries, which we must remember at this time when Nahel Mezouk is still battling for freedom and people like him. Mr. Chairman, Comrades, ladies, and gentlemen, against these grand objectives, what is your verdict? Has the Fourth Republic of Ghana delivered? More than three decades on, is the Fourth Republic delivering, or has it just turned into a miracle that led nowhere? Let us look at some selected hard data and facts to tell some bits of the story. Admittedly, not all of it, but some bits. Chuku Norris. Where are we now? One fact that binds all living things together is the fact that we eat. I must focus in the interest of time. Therefore, I will look at a few trends on food consumption and production in recent times to paint a picture of where we are economically today. 
In insightful research undertaken by April Partners, a study on trends in 44 food categories across sub selected sub-Saharan African countries and focused on low-income families, there were important findings. This study involved Ghana, and I will say a few things about the Ghana section. The first thing to note for an audience like this is that the poor, not the bourgeois, the poor, are in the overwhelming majority. We must never forget that when we sit in posh restaurants and hotels and residences and saunas and whatever else the bourgeois love and say life has never been better. The poor are in the majority. In Ghana, 68% of the population, 23 million people, belong to low-income families. And in these families, given the figures I'm about to quote, were released in June 2023 and are therefore very fresh, life is indeed tough if not wretched. On average, their total household income per day, total household income per day is only 11 euros. That is 140 Ghana CDs, and the average size of the family is five. They must survive on 140 Ghana CDs a day. On this meager sum for an entire family, they must keep body and soul together and meet all their earthly needs. And then having to come calling for a bit of this through some extortionate faith leaders that have no mercy when it comes to milking people for money. About 50% of this 11 euros, 140 Ghana CDs a day, is spent on food alone. All else must fit into what remains. Remember, I said this is the fate of 68% of our population. Therefore, to survive and cope when a country like ours allows general inflation to hit, 54% and food inflation specifically tops 59.7% in 2022, 90% of parents in these households have changed their eating patterns. 39% skip some meals themselves so that their children can have something to eat. 36% of them mix more expensive products with cheaper ones in order to make a meal go farther. 32% of parents in the low-income category the overwhelming majority in Ghana, bear in mind, reduce the amounts eaten by each person at meal times, And 24% serve the cheapest possible foods. This is heartbreaking in the extreme. The report referred to Ghana's food inflation as, quote, suddenly out of control, end of quote. Interestingly, though many Ghanaians think of our nation as a bread-eating nation, only 45% of this segment can afford it now. Everywhere in this country, it will seem there's a church springing up. There they chant for God to give us our daily bread. Now even bread is out of our reach. On the streets of Lagos, in typically felicitous pidgin English, you will hear it said, If now butter go delay my daily bread, please, almighty God, give me my bread like that. I get beans. Now, even that bread is denied the ordinary person. The phantom god of the uncaring bourgeoisie, the politicians of the bourgeoisie, and all others have failed most of our people. And the people so failed will one day strike back in anger. For it is true what they say, when the poor have nothing to eat, they will eat the rich. My friend, Dr. Mzomo Masito of South Africa, likes to say, the poor cannot sleep because they are hungry, and the rich cannot sleep because the poor are awake. Every government of the Fourth Republic, every political party when in power, promises an agricultural revolution, a step up in production of food. Then nothing much happens. The miracle leads nowhere. The much vaunted planting for food and jobs is just another example. The latest in a string of miracles that, if I may borrow Chinua Achebe's description of Shehu Shagari's agricultural policies, gave much food for thought, but nothing for the stomach. <laughs> As though to set us off in this discussion tonight, Ghana has recently been ranked ninth as the most financially secretive country in Africa. This is according to the Tax Justice Network's Financial Secrecy Index. The Financial Secrecy Index is a ranking of jurisdictions most complicit in helping individuals to hide their finances from the rule of law. Financial secrecy facilitates tax abuse, enables money laundering, and undermines the human rights of all. 
It is not difficult to see that the sort of democracy we practice, a Santa Claus democracy, has brought us here. The politicians are always giving out money to political party delegates and whoever else as bribes. Then no questions are asked about sources of funds for party financiers. As the guards of West Africa say, <laughs> We were promised transparency and accountability in the Fourth Republic. Rather, this is where we are. The metropolitan elites, the lumpen bourgeoisie, to use André Gunda Frank's expression, have fashioned out a system where ordinary people cannot track the creation and distribution of loot. A dense and opaque conspiracy for extraction of loot hangs above our heads. This is an existential risk to our country. We will become a narco-state at this rate. A society and politics that will be saturated by and taken over by illicit funds from narcotics trade unless we act now to tear down the walls of opacity. Chuku Norris. Now we must look at some trends across longer periods of the Fourth Republic. Again, in the interest of time, just a few randomly selected ones. And we will not stay detained by the over-focus on financial matrix that has become the bane of our development conversation. It is worth observing that getting accurate and consistent data in our country should be a simpler process. The media should lead the way in bringing our discourse on development to more granular data-led standards. We will all be better for it. I begin with good news. Meal consumption measured in kilos per capita per annum. At the end of the J.A. era in 2008, this stood at 7.6. By the de jure end of the John Evans Atamil's presidency in 2012, it had risen to 8.8, .8, a climb of 120 basis points. During the John Dramani Mahama presidency, the number snaked along slowly and rose by 50 basis points from 8.8 .8 to 9.3. From 2017 till now, a period of six years, the era of Nana Akufuado, this figure moved by 90 basis points, not very much, to 10.2. This at least is a story of improvement, however tepid. Let us look at a few other categories, only a few because we do not have much time. Toothpaste measured in grams per capita per annum. For six years, the consumption per capita has been more or less flat. 0 0.2 in 2017, 0 0.19 in 2018, 0 in 2018, 2019, 2020, then 0 0.2 in 2021, and dropping to the lowest point at 0 0.18 in 2022. Bar soaps measured in grams per capita per annum, this too has stayed effectively flat. In 2017, 1.1 in 2017, 1.0 in 2018, 1.1 in 2019 and 2020, 1.2 in 2022, then right back to 2017 levels in 2022 at 1.1. Life expectancy trends. I'm sure everybody is interested in life expectancy because you expect to go home today. <laughs> With the help of my friend Kwame Sapong Asiedu, a man knowledgeable about matters to do with healthcare in Ghana, I looked at what was happening to the health of citizens in aggregate. These figures are all taken from NOMA 2022, and that report is based on WHO data. In 1990, two years before, or actually three, before we began the Fourth Republic, Ghana's life expectancy at birth was 55.6 years, ranking 155th out of 193 countries and territories. This improved steadily to 64.7 years in 2019, but the rest of the world had made much more progress. Therefore, with life expectancy up to 64.7 years, Ghana now ranked 156th. We had actually fallen. At the latest check, Ghana has slipped now to 63.8 years. We have been surpassed by post-conflict societies like Rwanda, now at 66.7 years, and Sudan, at 65.3 years. Even more worrying is that in 2022, Rwanda and Sudan invested on a per capita basis in healthcare expenditure, 57.5 US dollars and 33.23 per capita per annum, while Ghana invested 84.98 US dollars. What is Ghana not doing right then? 
it is indeed a worrying situation. Ominously, of Ghanaians who retire at 60 years of age, 60% die by their 65th birthday. Only 3.6% of Ghana's population, according to this report, is above 65 years. This will mean since the same figure stood at 3.2% in 1966, that in the last 57 years, we have moved this figure by only 40 basis points. When I visited Hainan City in China in April of this year, I was told that there are 7,000 centenarians, people above the age of 100, that is, in that city alone. Accra flooding problem. Since Jerry Rawlings in 1992, through J.A. Kufo and then Mills and Mahama to Akufuado, every May, June, Accra floods. Each one of these presidents, every year, has promised to end the problem. They visit the scenes of destruction with media in tow and a train of their colleagues from cabinet, like my good friend. <laughs> then video clips go viral of severe flood situations sent by us, the ordinary people. In July, like we are in July now, the rains stop. The citizens forget about the rains. The politicians, government, and opposition stop talking about floods. The media moves on to discuss which celebrities slept with who. Until, Mr. Chairman, we are in May, June again, the year after, and the cycle begins anew. Perhaps this is the best characterization of the great Fourth Republic of Ghana, a merry-go-round of miracles that lead nowhere. Politicians who know they can take the people for granted because the people themselves are not serious about their welfare. For how else can I explain that we leave fatal floods to focus as a nation on which adult is having consensual sex with another in the privacy of their, their homes or whatever else? Literacy rates. Even I am stunned by the scale of collapse that the official numbers are reflecting. I am still waiting for official explanation on whether the basis of measurement changed from 2020 and 2022. Else, how does one explain the reported figure of 69.8% for 2022, when in 2010 we were at 71.5%? What happened to free SHS then? Gini coefficient. This, as you all know, is a measure of the degree of inequality in a country. Again, the numbers are startling and show a worsening situation on inequality. In 1998, the Gini coefficient was 40.1. It has steadily worsened to a peak of 43.5% when John Mahama left office and more or less stayed there through the Akufuado era. Open defecation. From 2000 to 2020, a period of two decades, open defecation, two decades, you heard that right, open defecation moved from 21.7 to 17.8%, a move of less than 400 basis points. It may appear to you I'm being uncharitable and that I should celebrate improvement however small. Think about this then. In the period of time that Narendra Modi has been Prime Minister of India, just over eight years, from 2014 to now, open defecation rates in India have dropped from 44% to 15%, according to the World Health Organization, this is a drop of nearly 3,000 basis points in eight years compared to our 400 basis points in 20 years. Make your own conclusions. In 15 years, from 2000 to 2015, Rwanda under Paul Kagame all but eliminated open defecation according to the WHO. Are we serious with this democracy we call the Fourth Republic? What then happened to the so-called rapid expansion in numbers of places of convenience? I end this section by saying that the focus of neoliberals only on financial indicators is dangerous and ruinous. It is important that development be returned to a discussion about the real long-term health of society. What is to be done? Mr. Chairman, the Fourth Republic has been around for three decades. There are many ways in which 30 years is a long time. Jesus Christ lived only three years more. The spectacular transformation of Singapore from third world to first happened in 25 years. In my view, in terms of impact, for who else has led 700 million people out of poverty and a nation of 1.4 billion to prosperity, Deng Xiaoping is by a distance 
the most historically significant leader of a government the human race has ever known. Deng officially led China from 1978 to 1989, 11 years. That is it. When we started the Fourth Republic, Paul Kagame was still a gorilla in the bush. Rwanda was still to undergo genocide in 1994. So how come they have taken a severely damaged society and at least got it functioning again? Yet we are still here watching both MPP and NDC leaders through the years blame the international environment, external shocks, and whatever new vocabulary they produce from time to time. Neoliberals, which is what both the NDC and MPP have become, are generally good poets, it seems. They have catchy slogans to promise miracles that lead nowhere and felicitous phrases to explain away non-delivery. I have elected to look at six areas in the interest of focus. The six areas I will make remarks about are land reforms, chieftaincy, galamse, education, religion, and revamping public sector boards. There are many other particularly important aspects of development, but those will have to wait for another time and or another speaker. Mr. Chairman, we face structural deformities as a nation. We cannot resolve structural problems by tinkering at the edges. Structural problems require structural solutions. Therefore, I do not intend to tinker at the edges this evening. Land reforms. It should be obvious to us all that we are facing a crisis. The existence of heavily armed private militias, euphemistically referred to as land guards, is enough pointer to the crisis. The Achimota School Forest Land Grab, the not-so-transparent sale of state-owned lands in upper-class areas, the matter of relatively short ownership leases, some now down to 30 years and so on, what is going to happen to the expensive buildings standing on such lands once the leases expire? Then there's the vexing issue of Alodia lands. In 2023, must we accept as the basis of law that someone owns land because they were first to arrive on it? How was that determined? Who was there when the first person arrived? And so on. Must chiefs continue to own lands based on conquest? How different is that from the colonialists arguing that they conquered some people and therefore had the right to own their land? Is that not legitimization of brigandage? The questions are many. The current president has himself expressed concern in times past on land litigation. The time is not enough to deal with them all. Can anyone in this room point out just one country in modern human history which did not benefit from either the Atlantic or transatlantic slave trade or colonialism and still made it to development and prosperity without major land reforms. No one can. It does not exist. So why have Ghanaians, some Ghanaians convinced themselves that we will be the first? God loves us for sure, but do we really believe that God loves us more than everybody else in the world? It is obvious to me that the Revised Land Act did not go far enough. It tinkered at the edges. To restore sanity to our land ownership regimes, we like China, Cuba, Vietnam, Thailand, Singapore, South Korea, to some extent Rwanda and some others, must carry out radical reforms. We cannot escape this if we want development. Rather than impose my views, which my questions anyway hint at, I will suggest that we convene some of our best thinkers. The word thinkers does not mean only formally educated people. These thinkers must represent the entire range of stakeholders involved in the matter. They must formulate a new land ownership philosophy that will guide the drafting of new laws to govern land in a modern Ghanaian state that wants to prosper. Of course, to do this, we will need a competent state led by determined and decisive people. This neoliberal democracy, with its over-monetized features, cannot deliver that. Governments under this dispensation are corroded by vested interests. If the Center for Development and Democracy was right, India estimates that it takes 100 million US dollars to win a presidential election in Ghana. There are many arising questions. 100 million is called 1 billion in America. In a country with a GDP of much less than 80 billion dollars, where does that sort of money come from? Can anyone raise such amounts and not be beholding to powerful vested interests? Who audits the source of these funds? 
could funds channel to our political actors be an avenue of money laundering? Are we headed to state capture or are we even there? Regrettably on this occasion, I do not have the time to deal comprehensively with this matter. It will have to wait for another occasion, but in the fruits of neoliberal democracy are the seeds of its destruction. Those seeds are over-monetization and primeval greed. Here too, we must take urgent and structural action using the same modalities I suggested for land. True ku noris. Chief Tansi, this is a bit of a no-go area for some people. Chiefs are sacred to some aspects of society, but we must be careful of the creation of too many sacred cows if we really want to develop. That chiefs make some useful contributions to society is beyond reasonable dispute, in my view. The question that faces us in 2023 is what exactly should be the role of chiefs in a modern democratic republic? We hear they are custodians of culture. What, though, is culture? Just drumming, singing, dancing, eating, wearing colorful or dark clothes to celebrate or mourn? What about the cultures of science and technology and the internet? Are chiefs then custodians of artificial intelligence and of space exploration? These are matters we must carefully discuss. Are chiefs answerable to the state governance infrastructure in practice and in reality? Do they always seek the permission of state authorities in every nook and cranny of the country before they impose the many curfews and bans and prohibitions they sometimes announce? What are we to think when chiefs publicly threaten to kidnap other chiefs and the state does not act to address patent criminality? That the state is impotent before some powerful chiefs? When for a priority project of the government, such as the provision of hospitals, we hear the Minister of Health, a Minister of Cabinet rank, complain on multiple occasions that he is unable to get land, there is at least an anomaly. And that is me being charitable. Who then is in charge? And what are we to conclude? Surely, it points to the mess in our land management regime, but what else does it point at? Who is running the country? Could this have happened to Lee Kuan Yew, Deng Xiaoping, or Paul Kagame? As our people say, who born dog? You try this in those places, you know who runs the country. Our chiefs of the 21st century are allowed to give and execute criminal sentences. This has happened in a part of the country. The state looked on paralyzed. I will give one final example of the dysfunction we face and then move on again in the interest of time. I was beyond astonished when I woke up one morning to hear the chiefs in a part of one of our most strategically important lacustrine cities, our major port city in Tema, had made an inconsiderate request. They wanted electricity supply cut to the city so they could organize a funeral. In the 21st century, I apologize if this offends anyone, but I do not see how it can be justifiable that a country with so many development challenges will shut down its major port city to organize a funeral. Had there been more time, I would have looked at funerals in general too, but that will have to wait. I do not, have never, and will never advocate a total and outright ban on chieftaincy. I do sound the caution, though, that the institution itself must champion its evolution to make it more consistent with a 21st century Republican democracy. All non-beneficial reminders of feudal times, like palanquins that require able-bodied people to hoist other able-bodied people must be jettisoned. These days, they even dance to ape life, the chiefs. When you see them, they're on the palanquins and they're dancing to Buga, the, the song Buga. I don't know whether that is what uh, Kobia Manfi and the others also, also did, but these days it's fashionable. The institution must be seen to respect and report to the governing authorities of the state in practice, not just on paper. People bristle when we call for human born palanquins to be banned. I, in turn, always ask bourgeois audiences whether they or their siblings or children ever carry these palanquins. Or it is other people's children, they expect to do this in preservation of the culture they claim to love so much. I remind the chiefs and I leave it there. I would not like to see change happen that way 
But those who make peaceful change impossible make violent change inevitable. Change will come when it comes, but it will be by evolution or it will be by revolution. They must decide whether they prefer and act now before this becomes a fire next time. Chu Ku Norris. Galam say, this is today such a topical issue that I will not repeat well-rehearsed arguments. All I will say is that at a seminar organized by the Ghana Institution of Engineering, a PhD qualified mining engineer mentioned that 10%, 10% of the Ghanaian population now depends on the extended value chains of Galamse for livelihood, 10%. How we sat and allowed this problem to become this big is the stuff of mystery about our national character. It must again be solved by thinkers. Soldiers alone will fail. We now have an extraordinarily complex problem on our hands involving enormously powerful vested interests that have rendered the state effectively impotent. However complex and multilayered the problem, this generation must come together and resolve it. Education. I will say only two things. We must decolonize our educational curricula, and we need to make some changes to the free SHS program. In 1952, Dr. Franz Fanon, the psychiatrist, writer, and revolutionary thinker from Martinique, wrote in Black Skin, White Masks, and I quote, the colonial school is a school of alienation. It is a school that teaches the colonial child to despise himself and his people to admire and imitate the colonizer and to aspire to assimilate into the dominant culture, end of quote. Stressing the point further in his 1964 work toward the African Revolution, Fanon said, the colonized intellectual who decides to fight colonialism identifies himself with the people by a radical decision which modifies his existence. He becomes aware of the need for an authentic natural culture, but this culture does not exist in a pure state. It is not a heritage that can be handed down with a certificate of birth. It is rather a reality in the making, a reality that is constantly being created and recreated by the people in their struggle for freedom and dignity. End of quote. Earlier in 1961, in his epic work with the foreword of the existentialist thinker and revolutionary Jean-Paul Sartre, the wretched of the earth, Fanon again remarked, the education of the masses must be such that it prepares them for action and gives them an understanding of their role in history. It must not be an education that teaches them to repeat slogans or to memorize formulas. It must be an education that teaches them to critically and creatively to question and challenge authority and to participate actively in the transformation of their society, end of quote. Beyond saying that, I am still unable to understand how, in 2023, Achimota School sees nothing wrong with asking teenagers to sing praises to God in Gajisberg, a patently racist colonial governor. I have nothing to add. I again denounce Achimota School, my alma mater, for this reactionary act. In this Fourth Republic, Nana Akufuado promised and promised and promised that he would move Ghana away from the Gajisberg economy a typical economy of the periphery built to produce unprocessed raw materials and supply cheap labor to the metropole. The colonial project was constructed to transfer sustenance from the periphery to the metropole. That was its main objective. Now we sing thanks for this. Amazing. We should borrow from the wisdom also of Professor Walter Rodney, a martyr of the global African revolution. In his magnum opus, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, Rodney wrote, and I quote, the educated Africans, people like yourselves and me, were the most alienated Africans on the continent. At each further stage of education, they were battered and succumbed to the white capitalist system, and after being given salaries, they could then afford to sustain certain metropolitan cultural standards. End of quote. I will let the point rest there. These ancestors have made it better than I can. Now I turn to free SHS. And simply say, a system that insists the state must pay fees for children who, of people who can afford to buy Bugattis is broken. So is a system that subsidizes fees for people who can afford to keep one side chick or more, buy air tickets for international travel, drink expensive liquor, wear designer clothing, and very expensive Brazilian wigs. 
There is nothing more I wish to add, Mr. Chairman. Chu Ku Norris. Religion. As religion is not a rational space, I try to avoid debates in this space as much as possible. My comments here will therefore be relatively brief. In all my travels, we are the only people I have encountered that go to church and sing to dance to mock our ancestors, saying they worship fetishes, but we are more enlightened and do not. And I have been around the world quite a bit. This is the only country that I have seen that happening. How dare you mock your ancestors? What is wrong with us? This is a fundamental misunderstanding of the fact that we believe in a God that existed long before European contact with Africa started. We have songs that acknowledge that God has been there since creation. In our own African faiths, the appellations for God make many associations with the beginning of time. Asasiya, Totoro Bonsu. Or Titibutan, there's that song. I think Mrs. Pebby taught me that song. Or your Titibutan, Yami Ondayo. We sing that song. That is, that is part of us. Mau, Olodumari, Chineke, Mungu, just a few examples. Professor Kofi Asariopoku has talked himself almost hoarse about this issue, but it continues. The spread of churches into residential areas and the growing tendency for all night services even on weekdays, is a major dampener on productivity. Congregants do not sleep, and they keep their neighbors awake also. At work the day after, how can anyone expect people who are so sleep-deprived to be productive? What is the minimum qualification or training someone must have to start a church in Ghana? How is this checked and enforced? The reality is that we have a free-for-all now. Just anyone can become a priest, and they start toying around with people's fates and vulnerabilities. I will limit my comments to just this. In Rwanda, Paul Kagame has established clear minimum qualifications for priests of any faith. They are all required to study theology up to tertiary level. It is not possible to just build churches wherever meets an individual's fancy in Kigali. Noise pollution is properly regulated. We should just go there and learn how they did it, then we will need to discuss how we too can get the courage and the determination to implement the learning. Public sector revamp. President Akufuado relatively recently made clear his dissatisfaction with the performance of some public sector boards. Barely a month after this, a cabinet minister and a public sector board chairman exchanged tense letters that somehow leaked to the media. Another opportunity to improve governance we should discuss on another occasion these incessant leaks to the media of official correspondence. The, quick, the key question that arises for me, though, is does the executive, ultimately the president, not appoint these boards? What then explains these furiously blinking lights of trouble on the deck? Let us get straight to the point. If you turn public sector boards into a dumping ground to reward party loyalists who did not make it to cabinet or parliament, you take an excessively elevated risk. Many serious countries like China, Singapore, Rwanda, South Korea, and so on, treat public sector boards as one of their major delivery vehicles for executing public policy. They put the absolute best resources they can get from their societies on these boards. And in some cases, they reach out for the best available in the world, period. It is true what they say about garbage in, garbage out. If you turn public sector boards into dumping grounds for the unplaced from your campaign trail, you will reap dysfunction. That is a predictable outcome. The two processes, campaigning and corporate governance, are not the same. Sometimes a campaign trail in our country needs more brawn than brain. We know about the vigilantes and macho men that constantly threaten our peace during election periods. You find all sorts among them, even criminal elements. You cannot transplant such characters straight from the heli belly of campaign trails to boardrooms and not expect considerable chaos. Some people have extraordinarily little clue of what corporate governance is all about. Such people are totally beholden to political authorities for their continuation as board members. How do they then confront poor, poor governance which directors must do when necessary? There are many whose only idea of leadership prior to joining one of these boards was of traditional leaders with divine rights. They too become board chairpersons and board persons and assume they must enjoy the divine rights of kings. 
Modern corporate governance requires tremendous capability. The responsibilities on boards are onerous. It is easy to end up in jail as a board member if you are not diligent and courageous. Boards and directorships are not for amateurs. As my senior at the Ghana Association of Writers, Abe Kusego, once told us, the funeral of a great chief is not a playing ground for little children and inexperienced hands to experiment with new dirges. We must amend our laws to take away the responsibility for appointing boards from politicians. We need a much more balanced and meritocratic process, one that puts competence before party affiliation. Then there is now the strangeness that plagues the Fourth Republic. Once a president leaves, all boards are dissolved. Even handlers of public toilets change. How, in such a climate, does anyone manage to build mastery of the craft? Yet, this is our neoliberal democracy. No continuity at this level. Kenya amended its constitution to ensure that some positions were required to be advertised publicly when vacant. In addition, applicants are interviewed in the media by independent panels. Without such an arrangement, the reforms Willy Mutunga undertook as Chief Justice could not have happened. There is no way the earring-wearing Chief Justice Dr. Willy Mutunga would have been accepted as Chief Justice in the Mwai Kibaki presidency. This is my resolute view. There are many examples of working systems across the world which we should look at and borrow. Rwanda, Singapore, and China come readily to mind as countries with strong public sectors. Chu Ku Norris. Mr. Chairman, I must now begin to wrap up. Time has run out. This event has been brought about by the agency of an amalgam of professional groups. It is only fitting, therefore, that I make very brief comments about what they, too, can do to speed up our approach to development. I will use one case study only to illustrate my point, and I return to the issue of floods. Every year, like clockwork, there are floods in Accra. People die. The media reports it. Insurance companies pay out claims for damage. Businesses are disrupted. Society plunges into turmoil. And then the beat goes on as soon as the rains stop. Every year, as soon as the rains are gone, we forget about their danger. What kind of people are we? Do our professionals of the built environment, architects, quantity surveyors, engineers, etc., have an implementable point of view on what should be done? Where, what about the finance people? Banks suddenly have clients that cannot service loans because floods disrupt their clients' businesses. The public health dimension of the matter keeps health professionals busy. Lawyers must get involved in settling disputes caused by the floods. Priests are called on to pray so that the rain goes away. After all, they pray for stability of the city. What, what else can they not do? How can we live with this? What is the point of view of the professionals about this development tragedy? Nothing. We are all partly guilty for our retardation as a country. Professor Donald Sean was right when he said, and I quote, so long as a practitioner chooses to play an intermediary role, he cannot avoid the conflicts inherent in the role. With characteristic vigor and unapologetically, even before I was born, Professor Noam Chomsky thundered this declaration, and I quote, it is the responsibility of intellectuals to speak the truth and to expose lies. End of quote. He could not have been clearer than that. Have we lived up to that as intellectuals and professionals? Mr. Chairman, I would like to discuss leadership at this stage by telling a story from football. Hopefully, those who like football, which I suppose is most likely every Ghanaian above the age of two, will follow easily. Asked to talk about something he would never forget from his playing days, Jibril Sisse, the ex-French international and a former Liverpool FC star, told a truly remarkable and fascinating story, at least in my view. Y hear him. I will never forget Steven Gerrard's team talk at halftime during the 2005 Champions League final, said Jibril Sisse. For those of you that have no recollection of the game, this was the European League final played in Istanbul, Turkey, between AC Milan and Liverpool. At the end of the first half, Liverpool was down to AC Milan by three goals. As in, the score was 3-0. Jibril Sisse says the players got to the changing room crestfallen. For 3-0, it's not a minor margin to go down by in one half of a football match. In his own words, 
Steven Gerrard gets up and asks all the coaching staff to leave the dressing room because he wanted to be alone with just the players. All the staff left, even the physios who were giving treatment to the players. Stevie gets up and says that Liverpool is all he has. It is his club, all he has ever known. And he does not want to be the laughing stock of the history of the Champions League. He says that if we respect him, this is Jibril Sisi speaking, and love him as a captain, then we need to dust ourselves off and get back in the match. If you have not watched that game, please do. For when they got back onto the pitch, Steve Gerrard, the captain, and therefore leader of the Liverpool team, was like a man possessed. He was absolutely on fire. In Jibril Sisi's narration of events, he said about Steve Gerrard, he scores the first goal. He gets the penalty. He has an extraordinary second half, finishing the game as a right back. He has a crazy march, but that halftime speech will remain imprinted in my mind forever. Fantastic leader. End of quote. For those who do not recall the game, it ended at 3-0 and went to penalties, which Liverpool then won and became European champions. As you can imagine, it was an electric moment for Liverpool fans and sympathisers, equivalent to the day of Pentecost. Indeed, when the final penalty was scored by Liverpool, the commentator screamed, Liverpool has come back from the dead. Let no one ever tell you leadership does not matter. Leadership matters. It really does. Many times in life, it comes down to who has more will. Antonio Gramsci gave us the felicitous statement, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. Pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. Pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. Ghana is at that point where we must summon the will, whatever it takes. We are at a critical conjuncture, and we must come together to save the country. The great Jedouble Ambule is a second D Takradi boy. Indeed, he told me second D Sicado specifically. They were way ahead of contingency planning and project management, those people. They used to say sea never dry. But they also prepared for it, for if the sea dried, by saying when sea dry, we go by land. <laughs> Amazing strategic planning. Ambule would have said at such a critical time, he actually said he was going to be here, but he probably wasn't able to make it. Ambule would have said at such a critical time, we are now at as a country. Agrono edru simi guadu. Yebe bonde ju, yebe bonde kwajdos. The retaltable super odi at such moments would shout, the thing is now critical. And his colleague on the Osofu Dazi series, Kojo Kwachi, would say something evocative of the times. Kojo Kwachi took a metaphor from the threadbare aphromosis sandals of the pseudo Marxists of the early days. The second Jerry Rowling sensation. When things were really challenging, he would say pensively, a back a day, and he had to canvas. A back a day. For Ghana right now, a back a day, and he had to canvas. This is our moment for leadership, and we must live up to it. Chuku Norris. A personal letter to Nana Kufado, and then I'm done. Those worried about the time, I'm done. Dear Nana, I was recently out of university when I first met you. At the time, you lived at East Cantonments. Recently bereaved, Kwesi Prat Jr. and I had come to commiserate with you and to express our condolences. You were grateful to see us, but clearly shaken by events, as would be expected of a fresh widower. Soon after we arrived, Professor Edubuahin arrived to spend time with you. As usual with Professor Edubuahin, he brought good cheer to even a house of mourning in no time. He spotted me and then said immediately to Kwesi Prat that my father was his friend and they had been friends since their school days in 1946. He told us about how they stood up to the colonialists together in 1948 after the shooting of the ex-servicemen. He warned Prat that there was no way he would allow him to infect me with his ideas. Everyone was in stitches, even you, the widower, laughed. We sat down for a more serious conversation, and in no time, we were discussing the need for all the pro-democracy forces to unite. I must have been 24 then. I had just started working, but these leading lights of the political opposition made me feel comfortable and treated me as an equal. Nana, even though you kept pleading with us to give you time to finish with your immediate preoccupation of organizing the funeral of one close soul to you, I will stand by the clarity of your thinking. You argued convincingly and laid out clear strategies. The funeral was done, and you bounced back even stronger 
if I recall right, you were the first one to invite Nkrumah's politicians, Kweku Baku Jr. and Kwesi Prad Jr. to speak on an MPP platform. When the AFC came along, the Nkrumah's politicians in the group were in sync that they wanted you as their spokesperson. As AFC spokesperson, you were methodical and diligent, reading draft statements with Akoto and Pao, going through routes for marches, striking consensus with disparate groups, and negotiating difficult agreement, agreements. At the same time, people were being hounded at the courts, and your other leg of greatness emerged. So many ran to you when they were in trouble, and there was lots of trouble in those days, for it was a dangerous time in this country then. You and Akoto and Pao rendered services pro bono. Who can forget the day of judgment on the page 28 case, as it came to be known. An articulate and courageous Anna Akufuado, in righteous rage, confronted the Supreme Court of Ghana about what he saw to be injustice. As you spoke, so frightened was the crowd at the court that the Gestapo would finish you off, that people spontaneously rose to calm you down. But Akufuado could not be stopped. I still remember some of your words from that era, and I quote, a corrupt a timid, a planned judiciary is a menace to social peace. This was an Akufuado before the Supreme Court. When it came to whether or not you should stand for president, I attended the AFC meeting at the behest of Chrissy Pratt Jr. You sat quietly and listened to me, who had no locus in Ghanaian politics, articulate my reasons for why it was not yet time. Then you stunned everyone by saying I had convinced you, and you postponed your bid. Over the years, when people accused you of being arrogant and aloof, I narrated these and many other stories like this. Many immediately said in response, the man must really respect and like you. Even this year, you praised me somewhere, you had no idea where it would get to me from, but two people told me, I thank you. I could never have imagined that there will be a day when I will be told by people close to power that I do not respect you or that I do not have goodwill towards you. But here we are. Where is the Akufuado we looked up to? The fearless, detail-oriented Akufuado, where is he? That is the Nana Akufuado people expected when they were told during your campaign for the presidency that Nana Akufuado, Yenimnu Free Titi. Where is he? Likewise, Nana, I do not know if he remembers. I once sat next to him on a five-hour flight from Johannesburg to Accra. John Dramani Mahama told me he knew my father from Legon. He shared with me how he would like to see a new generation of politicians work across party lines to move Ghana forward. He was an agreeable man, a pleasant fellow. What happens to politicians once they get to power? Mr. President, I suspect you know I do not care about political parties. The MPP and NDC have both capitulated to neoliberalism, and without radical surgery, in my view, they are finished as crucibles of transformational change. Once the AFC was gone, for me, it was paradise lost. Until we clean up our politics and rid it over, of the over-monetization, I will worry about our party politics. That it has become what Wale Inka called a public auction for the highest bidder. Therefore, I cannot be concerned about what the outcome of the 2024 elections in terms of which aspect of the duopoly wins. Mr. President, I am not naive, but my heart is heavy when I hear senior members of your own political party say the Akufuado presidency is over and that we must wait for the next presidential candidate to drive change in Ghana. Are these not the same politicians that taught us a week is a long time in politics? How ca then can a president be finished with a year and a half to go? I know that things are not as they used to be with all the leaders of the erstwhile AFC, but there were people who looked you in the eye and told you the truth. For Ahunu Honga's sake, meet them and ask them again to tell you the truth. Before August, also invite all the living people I mentioned at the start of this speech. They too will tell you the truth. They will, so that people stop telling you that we should focus on rating agencies. For what? Make structural changes and the rating agencies will lose material significance for you. A couple of months into your presidency, I delivered the first in the Achimoto Speak series for the 90th anniversary of the school. I cautioned them that arduous work lay ahead. In euphoria, one of your appointees told me publicly that the country would be transformed in only two years. I asked that we meet again in two years to assess. It has now been six. Every theme I touched on today, I also mentioned then. 
I do not need to say any more. Bring back the Akufu Ado we knew and make a difference in the time left. Like St. Peter said to the beggar with disabilities, rise up and walk. Amen. Amen. Now we close. Compatriots, like they say in the South African language, Nyanja, Tiende Pamozi. Forward together. The Yoruba say Africa, Loku. We must make this Africa's time. The African people must reach out with seriousness, determination, original thinking, and action for development so that the overwhelming majority of Africans escape poverty and live in dignity. Now is the time. In that great mission, African people must give their best and never fear. Never fear. Never fear. Our ancestors would say in drumming home this point, and I cite it in Akan only because I must choose one language, Never fear. I leave each one of you to your own conclusions about whether or not the Fourth Republic has delivered what it promised. I do not think it has. Mr. Chairman, I am done. Thank you. Aluta continue. <laughs>